Good evening, everyone. If I could have your attention, um, I'm Bob Meenan. I'm the Dean of the School of Public Health. I'm really happy you could all come and visit me in my house tonight. Um, so uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here tonight. Um, as many of you know, I am limping and quacking. Um, I'm, I'm a lame duck. I will be wrapping up my tenure as Dean at the end of December. Uh, and moving on to be special assistant to the president. So it's been a fantastic run. Um, it will end at 20, 22 years and two months, which has a certain numerological cadence to it. Um, one of the nice things is it's given me a chance to reflect on what's happened during my time at the school. And uh, it's really just been great to watch the school grow and strengthen. And uh, many of you remember uh, um, all those changes that happened. It's, it's hard to remember that I guess about 15, 17 years ago, we were scattered all about the campus. We didn't have a Talbot building. Um, 12 years ago, probably, we did not have a Department of International Health or a Center for Global Health. Um, we probably had about 500 students. Now we've got about 1,000. Um, so it's really been very gratifying to see it, it happen. And um, a major f uh, factor in all of that have been the alumni. And uh, over the years, the alumni have always been committed to the school, have done remarkable things to help the school, and particularly in the area of helping our current students get practica and helping our uh, current students get connected with jobs. And I very much appreciate uh, all the support that the alumni have given, but particularly in those areas. So um, as of January 1, I will become a special assistant to the president, which I'm now fond of saying the acronym for that job is SAP. Um, <laughs> um, and. Uh, I'm really excited by the opportunity that uh, President Brown has given me to do this. I've, I've got a couple of major tasks that I'm already working on. One is employee benefits, um, and the other is student health. So I've told the President that I want to thank him for allowing me over the next year to become the least popular person at Boston University um, <laughs> as I revise both employee benefits uh, for faculty and, and staff and student health. But uh, I'm very, very pleased about our, uh, our new dean, Sandra Galea. Um, is coming in. We'll be starting just January 1st. Uh, he's a remarkably strong uh, candidate to take on this job. He's currently the Gelman Professor and Chair of Epidemiology at Columbia School of Public Health. Uh, Sandro is, I think, 42 years old, 43 years old. He's already an elected member of the Institute of Medicine. Um, he has something like 400 publications on his CV. He is a, a very energetic, very bright guy, and I think he's going to take the school to, to even greater levels. So it's a very, very nice handoff. The timing has worked out very well. Sandro uh, will be able to come in and start a strategic planning cycle, and then, believe it or not, accreditation is coming up again, and he'll be off and running. Um, so I'm, I'm very, very pleased at that. Um, so events like this are great, especially in the last couple of weeks, because they let me uh, be sort of ceremonial and, and wax a little bit uh, nostalgically about what's happened at the school. And I'm taking particular enjoyment in this one for a couple reasons. One is I'm not the, the main reason you're here, which is great. Um, there'll be a few of those coming up in the next week or two, and I'm still a little squirrely about it. Um, but this is really about the, the, the uh, lectureship and our, and our guest speaker. So I'd like at this time to, uh, to introduce uh, Charlie Donahue. Charlie is the uh, funder of this series of public health lectureships, uh, Frontiers in Public Health Speaker Series. Uh, this is the second one we've had. Uh, Charlie's support has allowed us to bring in outstanding speakers, to uh, have this sort of nice uh, reception and speaker combination, and I really want to thank him for it. Uh, Charlie is well known to people in the, the Boston health and public health area. Uh, Charlie has had multiple roles. He was a Peace Corps volunteer. Uh, he worked for the state government for quite some time. He actually worked at BU back in the day, working with Dick Eggdahl and the Health Policy Institute. And then he went out and he, he started a uh, health value company that really did wonderful things uh, for health benefits uh, for small businesses. Perhaps the most impressive thing on Charlie's resume, however, is his daughter is an SPH alum. Uh, so <laughs> let me uh, bring Charlie up to say a few words and get the thing started. Charlie? Uh, first of all, thank you all for coming. Uh, we would like some feedback from you and the, the materials on the chair. Part what you think about our presentation tonight and possible future programs, uh, future ideas you might have. Really like your feedback. 
Uh, we did ask some, if you, if you could, to read some articles before you came tonight. We'll try to get those back to those of you that didn't see them. But we'd also like to uh, keep in touch with you about books or ways to follow up at tonight's uh, lecture. Uh, uh, I was delighted when, when David said he had invited Kathy, who I, I met about 30 years ago when I was looking for help at the Health Planning Council for Greater Boston, as somebody who was respected by organized labor, uh, who really understood the health system, and she gave us a lot of great help, and she's gone on to be even more distinguished than back in those days. Uh, I think the topic tonight is important. Some of you here have another 30 years left in your health career, and uh, I, I unfortunately don't have that. I have my daughter, who hopefully will cause a lot of trouble that I tried to do years ago. But, uh, but I think we can learn a lot. I mean, Massachusetts has some potential, those of you that uh, stay here. Uh, we did have Mitt Romney uh, was asked to look at the health care when he first became governor. He didn't want anything to do with it. And finally, after about a year of research from conservative think tanks, Mitt was told that there's a lot of freeloaders out there who are costing all the rest of us money. We have to pay for the freeloaders. If some of them are rich, they don't want to waste their time with health insurance. And some would buy it if they had a little help. They can't afford $18,000 a year. For those of you that are going to have a family someday, that's the going rate today. But Mitt went to work and put something together. And then Mitt, when he finished with this, he said, this is something that's good basic conservative values, at least the conservatives in Massachusetts, not in other parts of the country. But how do we get this by Ted Kennedy? You know, Ted, you know, Ted is noted for killing some of these conservative ideas. In the 1970s, Richard Nixon had a health care idea. And he took it into the, to the Congress. And Ted said, I killed it. And I regret it, because in the 1990s, I tried to introduce the same plan that Richard Nixon tried to introduce. I couldn't get it in. And he said, I was the enemy of the, the perfect was the enemy <clears throat> of the good, the better. And I'm not going to do that again. So it fed you all is Ted Kennedy with men signing this. And it's got a ways to go. So maybe one step of many. Uh, when I was in graduate school, I used to go to Europe. To be perfectly honest, they had great, great pubs to drink. <laughs> <laughs> I survived at the Heineken beer place for a summer where you get free, free beer and, and cheese. I didn't have any money. But I was very interested in what we can learn from other countries that don't have all the hang-ups that we have in the United States, where poor Mitt Romney was afraid to be proud of what he did in Massachusetts against the candidates he ran against, which were lunatics, but you know, <laughs> the poor guy couldn't even be proud of what he did. But in Europe, there's conservatives, smart conservatives, and liberals, etc., and they come to a, together. Bismarck, in 1885, came up with this idea that if you want a good, solid country, you've got to make sure people of jobs and food and housing and healthcare. So those of you that want to be reformers, and we desperately need reformers, uh, to begin to learn what you know, countries in Europe have done and other places where they, they've brought together all these different viewpoints. And they know they're not happy. They're changing it. They're wasting money. We're at 17 to 18 percent of our gross domestic product for healthcare. And in Europe, they're happy. And they insure everybody, not the 50 million we don't insure. But they're happy, not perfect. But that difference of 10 to 12 percent and 17 percent of our gross to market product is a trillion dollars a year. We don't spend wisely, at least to the European critics who say they're smart people, they put them in on the moon, but they're kind of crazy what they do over there. <laughs> so, anyway, I want to thank Kathy for joining us. Uh, she's done wonderful work. She's been very innovative. And this is a very important topic. And I hope for some of you it's the beginning of learning what's out there, what, what can be done, that someday you know, could be brought home to Massachusetts and to the US. Kathy, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Charlie. Charlie, I know your career has expanded tremendously since you're in college. I hope your, your beer palate has also expanded from Heineken. <laughs> If, if it hasn't, I hereby offer you a master class that I will personally conduct for you uh, going forward. Um, well, it's a pleasure to, uh, to now bring up David Rosenblum. David is the, the chair of the Department of Health Policy and Management. Again, uh, a person who's had a uh, tremendously visible and effective career in uh, health and public health sectors, uh, 
both locally and nationally. I first met David when I was a brand new house officer and, and a young faculty member at Boston City Hospital. At the time, David was the Commissioner of Health and Hospitals, where he oversaw both Boston City Hospital and the Public Health Department, working in the Kevin White administration. He then went into industry, working closely with a, a good mutual friend of both of ours and, and was involved in Health Data Institute, which was one of the pioneer countries in what we would now think of as, uh, as health informatics. Uh, when I came back to the school, of, when I came to the School of Public Health, I was pleased and surprised to learn that David was there um, in our then Social and Behavioral Sciences Department, now our Community Health Sciences Department, running a major substance abuse prevention program uh, funded by the Johnson Foundation called Join Together, and David ran that for close to, to 20 years. Um, he then uh, accepted the challenge of. Uh, acting as the chair in the Health Policy and Management Department and has done an outstanding job. So David, I uh, call on you to introduce our speaker. Thank you very much, Bob, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm delighted that Kathy Shane is here for two reasons. One, uh, she is what most of our SPH students want to grow up to be. So, uh, uh, so I'm delighted for that reason, but I'm also delighted for the substance. Uh, Kathy has been at the Commonwealth Fund for uh, a very long time where she led most of the Commonwealth Fund's work on uh, international comparisons. Uh, prior to that, as uh, Charlie mentioned, uh, she was the Director of Benefits for the uh, Service Employees International Union, uh, helping that union uh, develop its uh, really path-breaking uh, benefits programs. Uh, and uh, it, in her deep, dark past, she's taught uh, health economics, uh, having graduated from Smith and Boston College, uh, and is now the uh, chair of the economic advisory group for the Commonwealth Fund, uh, and is continuing her activities in helping to bring the lessons across national boundaries uh, of what we can all learn from each other. So thank you very much for coming, Kathy. We look forward to it. Well, I'm, de I'm delighted to be here, and I've been given, as you can see the title, it's a, a pretty big title to be talking through. So what I'm going to warn you about as I go through these slides is it's a whirlwind tour. Um, I'll figure out how to get out, rid of that little escape button. A whirlwind tour of a lot of different policies, because I think when we look globally, about what can we can learn. We also can look within the United States for um, pieces of that and try to understand how different countries came to do what they did. Also, that there is no one best model when you look out there. There are a lot of countries that might be best practices for certain pieces. They can have their own histories, their own institutions, and they're evolving. You, not a single one of them would say they're perfect yet, uh, but they're getting better. And m increasingly, people are saying, where can we learn from other countries, including the United States? So it's a two-way street. My background, as you just heard, is um, a lot of international, cross-national work where we have been looking with surveys and also holding conferences to try to pick the brains of people and also work together to learn from each other with opportunities to improve. I'm a health economist by training, so I'm going to be talking a lot about payment and incentives because I think uh, people behave um, often in predictable ways if you push the but certain kinds of buttons, including information buttons. But I want to start with a little bird's eye view of how does the U.S. look compared to other countries, in case you haven't seen this data recently, and then dive into what's going on in these other countries. What are some of the key policies that are making a difference, whether it's a payment policy, access primary care, care system, information systems, or the way they focus on the population and population health. There are opportunities to learn, but we're going to have to take those learnings and insights and apply them to where we begin. Uh, Charlie already stole this slide a little bit on what, what do we see, and I'm mainly going to be talking about high-income countries. There are a few variations out there. Um, you often hear a debate in the United States that said single payer versus what the U.S. has. There, exact, there are actually a lot of diversity on how countries organize their systems, including some that don't have an insurance-based system. They run a health system like the U.K. But countries like France have a major role for private insurers. Germany, the Netherlands, and S Switzerland all divide up 
their insurance system into multiple competing insurance companies within a very tight, really regulated. The shared characteristic of all of them is they cover everyone. Um, and what we've had a few conferences where they got bent out of shape, several of these countries, because it looked like 1% of the population was uninsured and they wanted to drive it to zero. But that, they were focusing on that 1%. Um, but that's what they've been living with. Germany started very, very early. Um, and they started actually to defeat the socialists. They said if we give everyone health insurance through their work, they'll be feeling they get something out of a capitalist society. When you then say to Germans, you have a socialized medical system, they say, what are you talking about? <laughs> we have social insurance, but we have a private health care system. So the, the way their hospitals and doctors are organized is not that dissimilar to the United, from the United States. When we compare ourselves, and at the end of this lecture, I've got a few references, but if people want more, we've done quite a bit of comparative work, um, so I'm going to go through things quickly. When we compare ourselves, the one thing we clearly are the leader on, bar none, is costs. We are the most expensive country in the world, far away. We're kind of off the chart, but we don't get as much return on our investment as other countries get. Every once in a while, we're tied for leadership around some outcomes, but often we do a lot worse. The IOM put out this report, which I recommend anyone who hasn't looked at it, the shorter lives and poorer health, and they found in every age group there was a health outcome that didn't look as good. So we're not getting a return in a much younger population than several of these countries have. The other thing is the averages that I'll show you, just a few hide amazing variation within the United States. So we're divided as a country geographically, geographically and by income. So whatever you see as the average, there's usually something that's much worse than the average and something that's better than the average. Um, very big disparities by income and by geography. This is a, a bird's eye view of we're the most expensive country. Um, one side of this shows you per person spending in the United States, which is at least 50% higher than the next highest country. The other side shows you the share of our total GDP or national economy that we spend on health care. One of the things to look at as you look at both of these is that we didn't start out being far away from the pack. Um, if you go back to the 1980s, we weren't that different. Um, and this is a period when they were bringing in their national health insurance systems covering everyone. But they started to get control. And now I recently was in Australia where they're panicked they're going to get to 10%. They've been at nine for a really, really long time. And a decade out, they think 11, and that's, that would be disaster. We passed 11% a long time ago. So not only is that a lot of money, but it means resources are going into our medical and healthcare system that aren't going in to other parts of the system. And I'll end my talk a little bit on that. So just that difference alone between what we spend in the next highest country is more than the total education budget in the United States federal, state, and local. It's a lot of money, that difference. So right now, what we're hoping is we can hold the line. We don't think we're ever going to get lower, but if we could stop having it increase every year as a share of everything, we feel like we could fill up resources. When we look at how do we do on outcomes, I'm just giving you a few. And the first one is at the beginning of life. Our infant mortality rates are about double the leading countries. And again, within the United States, there are states where their rate is double the leading states within the US. And the best of our states isn't as good as the leading countries. So even though we're a big country, we, we're looking for pockets of excellence. We can find some. Utah's rates are pretty low. You know, so we can find some. But we're still um, not looking as good when we look at the, um, across the world. Uh, adolescent birth rates are extraordinarily high in the United States. And one of the reasons are infant mortality rates are so high as lots of premature babies. We do a pretty good job on saving them. We just have a higher percentage of all the births be premature, so not that many make it to year one. Um, this is starting to come down, and it's not just medical care, but it's the broader health and economic system. We don't do very well at the end of life. This particular statistic is death before age 75 of diseases that if you had early and effective care, you shouldn't die of. So diabetes before age 50, um, infections um, and uh, 
communicable diseases in children before age 14. So it's not all statistics. But what's been interesting as we're watching this, it's a sentinel indicator because the healthcare system matters for this, is we were um, doing better than the UK a decade ago. Um, we were second to last rather than last. Now we're last not because we're not doing better, it's just we're not improving as quickly. So our rates have been coming down. So you'll hear cancer rates are coming down, heart disease. So are they in other countries. You know, so medical sciences um, flow. Life expectancy, you've probably seen a lot of this, but we li don't live as long, we don't live as healthy. So you know, if you talk about healthy life, we could go through those too. But it, we, we look for places we're tied for leadership and can only find a few on outcomes. So I'm going to lead you through some thinking on why do we see these differences, what are the other countries doing, and give you some country examples. And I'll come back to this theme um, toward the end again, trying to tie it up. One is, um, for starters, is they have uniform payment systems and buying powder power. So even though they may organize themselves in competing insurance plans, they think of buying together. So when the German sickness funds sit down to negotiate what the hospitals are going to be paid each year, they all sit on one side of the table. There are lots of them, but they sit together. And they say, we're going to be pushing a similar kind of, if we're making a change, we're going to make it more generally. And we're going to be making it informed by data that we have on everyone who lives in this country, because they don't divide their country by age or by income. So you get questions like, what's it like for small business? What's it like if I'm not working? People go, those differences don't matter. Um, if you're 65 or you're five, you're going to be in the same insurance plan, even though you can choose. So it's uniform payment and buying power. They do bundle up more than we do um, so that they give primary care and hospitals more of a power of can you redesign your system underneath the bundle. They do less narrow fee for service we do and a lot more accountability for what they get. Their insurance systems are much simpler. And I'm just going to give you a couple statistics on how complicated they are. The Commonwealth Fund that I work for, I have worked with for 20 years, brings fellows over to this country. And their first experience, if they get sick in the United States, they come back and say, why do you tolerate this? I've never been any, it took them so much of their time just to figure out what things were going. And it adds up in a doctor's office, a hospital's office. There's a lot of focus in some of the leading countries on primary care, strengthening it, and enabling access to it, and reinventing it. Everyone is pushing for the redesign of primary care in the 21st century. They have national policies around information systems, too. One of this is a benefit of having everyone in a more unified system. You know the whole population. You don't have to do a research project to say what's the Medicare population, the Medicaid population in different states. The Dutch can do all 16 million people from the day they were born. They, they know some of that history. But they've also often built up very powerful information systems that do more than just the claims. And they focus on the whole population. So I'm going to do a little bit on payment and prices first, because one of the reasons we are so expensive is that we pay a lot more for everything than the rest of the world. We are younger. We don't go to the doctor as often. We don't go to the hospital as often. And when we do, we don't stay as long. So it's not our use rates. Even when we look at drug use in the United States, we're not higher. Uh, the German doctors write a lot of scripts. So do the French doctors. I mean, there's some countries that are lower, but we're not way up here on use. It's just every time we touch the healthcare system, anywhere we're paying more. And I'm just going to give you a few um, slides. And this is the result of having less buying power, less ability to say what's a reasonable price, what's the right way of paying, how can we line up incentives. So you hear a lot, and it's in the news again in the United States about our pharmaceutical prices. Um, even people like John McCain are saying, should we send people to Canada? Can we open up the Canadian borders and buy in Canada? Because prices are going up again. But the studies that have been done of this is we, again, we don't use more drugs. We buy a more expensive mix, and we pay more for those brand name drugs um, when we're buying it. We're good on generics. But th these are some recent numbers. It's extraordinarily the difference that you get on this. And this was um, where we still had a lot of uninsured people who didn't have drug coverage at all. 
When you look at simple kinds of diagnoses, appendectomy, hip replacement, bypass surgery, and you say, what's the total amount being paid? We're usually anywhere from two times to four times higher um, as you look across those country lines. And that's a combination of each element. This is a bundled payment. But if you look at that very far column on my chart, the 95th percentile in the United States is twice the um, amount that we pay on average. And there's one that's lower. So you don't even know what the price is with the United States because the average won't give you any information. Again, um, one of the shocks for our fellows is they said every time we ask, if we go to a hospital, how much will having a baby cost, people go, I don't know. Um, and then they can probe it. So Massachusetts is going to be one of the leading states to be able to answer that question. But these variations are extraordinary. And here's one that just takes one simple procedure, an MRI. And you can see what the 95th percentile is, what the average is, and what down at the bottom 25th percentile is. So we have three and five fold variations. It's true in this state. It's true in every state I've looked at in the US within a small marketplace. So it's not Boston versus Northampton. It's within the Boston marketplace. Um, and there's some correct price within that, but that level of variation would not be tolerated in other countries, and they would know what it is. Um, it just doesn't happen. They drive those prices down um, to sort of our Medicare level. Uh, Medicare is about at the international level. We are a much more complex system. And this adds, I'm staying on why are we so expensive. We add layers. Um, it amounts to doctor's time as well as patient time and complexity. And the estimates um, from insurance alone on the insurance side is at least $100 billion a year in excess costs at the insurance level. But that doesn't get into what about the doctor's office? What about the hospital office? Clerks, IT people, nurses and doctors that are doing reports for different payers. Um, every billing system is a little bit different. Every benefit design is a little bit different. And it's really extraordinary. Every time we do a study, and these are some of these studies were uh, financed by the Commonwealth Fund. So this is a recent one in health affairs. Our hospital payment per person is a lot higher, but the share of that hospital dollar that goes into central administrative costs is almost double what other countries are spending. And they're worried about their administrative costs. But it is you, you can go into hospitals and see floors of people um, and how many people per bed. And it's the complexity of the way we're regulating our system. So we have a market system, but we don't coordinate the regulations. Two places don't might be asking you to report on the same thing, but the reports are a little different. So it means one more person. So these are, tack, these are doable, um, and we could fill up free up a lot of resources if we could remove those layers. So turning to the care system itself, um, by the way, on primary care, the estimates are one and a half more people per practice in administrative level compared to a Canada and other countries. So it's, it's time and energy that the same amount of dollars more of it could go for care. So in primary care, everyone is looking at a model um, it's really quite remarkable conceptually when you are in an international that started in the United States. This is a diagram that Ed Wagner out on the West Coast did of a, called the chronic care model and saying what we envision is a primary care system that's in the middle, embedded, linked to the hospital, linked to specialists, but linked to housing, social services, and support in their interactions with patients. And it was called a medical home for very sick kids originally, but it's also for chronic care. But the notion wasn't an isolated physician out there. It was embedded in a larger care system, supported by decision and information. And this is a diagram that everyone is aiming for. How can we link back up? How can we be, have primary care be the gateway in, but also the link to other services where someone's at the hub? It's the first contact. One of the things that's happening in Oh, internationally is saying, well, if you want to link up and you want primary care to be accessible, focused on preven prevention, the whole child, the whole family, you shouldn't make it expensive to get into the practice. 
So they either have no cost sharing for primary care at all, or they drop it to minimalistic. So even countries that have a deductible don't do it for primary care. And this, this is what our population in the U.S. says about, I went without care because of cost. We've just done this again. This study was published with the elderly now. Our elderly are going without care because of cost. And they have serious problems paying medical bills. Switzerland has very high cost sharing, but they tier it by income. They worry about capping it at a certain level because they want care to be affordable, particularly primary care. The other thing countries have done with their primary care systems is build an infrastructure to support the practices. This again is a survey response on asking primary care doctors, do you have any after hours care where someone can see you? And the US rate's been going down. It was 40% a decade ago, so it's going in the wrong direction. But there's several countries where most of the physicians are saying yes. And that's coming from a combination of uh, a couple things. They are paid f with an extra rate for each person registered with them that they're patient to provide an infrastructure so they can hire a practice nurse so that they can afford to do after hours care. But you also have innovations. And we've got some care systems in the US looking at this. They say, let's do an after hours access system. So doctors don't have to be on call all the time. No one wants to go into primary care if you can be called out any time. It wraps around at night. Um, at, in the Netherlands, in Denmark, after a certain time of day, when you call the central phone number, it's answered, but not at the doctor practice, at the after hours care center. They're community based, and other money has gone in to support them. And I'll just talk a little bit about the Dutch system as an example, what does this look like? The Dutch haven't had it for that long, so we're not talking about 1882 for, for, for these kinds of innovations. Some of them are the doctors threw up their hands and said, we can't be on call all the time, but why send a person to the emergency department for a sore throat, for flu-like symptoms? So they, they passed a law that supports GP cooperatives, and this would be in Netherlands, it would be in an Amsterdam cooperative for all of Amsterdam, it's staffed by nurses who are actually in a clinic. They often co-locate it, so this little building with blue shutters is a hospital, but it's got a clinic called the After Hours Clinic. Um, they staff it, and the doctors rotate it through. So your doctor is seeing patients of other doctors, and they all can talk later about, you know, what, what's the practice. They have electronic medical records, so if your patient's been seen in the middle of the night, in the morning, you're getting that information. And that cute little yellow car is a um, home visiting car where the physician goes out with an oxygen tank to really sick, and they will decide you need to go to the emergency room, but the if you don't need to go, they're trying to bring care. It has brought down ED use, raised practice satisfaction, and the population loves it. So this, again, is a fairly recent innovation. And one of the doctors I sat next to at dinner one night, I said, what does this feel like um, in terms of running the cooperative? He said, we've gotten to know each other better as doctors. <laughs> Because we talk to each other, you know, and I'll say, what did you, what ended up happening with that patient of yours that I saw the other night? And they do more things as a group because they're doing more through this cooperative arrangement. So we only have these kinds of systems in a Kaiser Permanente out on the West Coast that says build it in, but there's no reason you couldn't build this in. It's, it's paid for in a fee for service. The doctors get paid for each patient they see. It's, they're not on salary, so it's fee for service. So that's an example, but there are several, uh, Denmark, uh, several countries have those community-based systems. New Zealand has one also. The other thing they've done um, to support both the primary care physicians, but to support understanding where we need to be resources is they've collected data on their populations from all their payers, if it's multi-payers. So they use that claims database as an analytic tool. Where are we having problems? Where are we seeing repeat admissions? Where is emergency room really high? If they know the patients are sicker and poorer and they have immigrant populations, several countries, the UK and Netherlands are two, they pay the primary practice more 
because the practice has a patient population that's going to take more time. But it's driven by an evidence base that they can see the need in the system. They also have um, been very innovative on comparative effectiveness. We now have a program in the United States that we looked abroad, but they're comparing clinical outcomes after it gets into the marketplace to say how well are different um, procedures, drugs doing, now that we can see it in the population. They run registries. We got uh, information in the U.S. about some hip devices, hip implants, replacements that were failing. Australia told them, Several joints aren't very good, and Sweden told us two small countries. We ignored it until the FDA finally had enough complaints that they pulled it off the market. But they could see it in the registries. You know, physicians were collecting it on all their patients, so it wasn't sporadic. So we're just starting to think this way, and these are group-supported, community, national-supported registries. You have to set them up. They're starting to use patient surveys on outcomes. If you had cataract survey, sur surgery. Uh, in Sweden, they ask you, can you see? Can you see better? It's, it's a pretty simple question. Are you walking, with, are you walking without pain? after? An, and, and when they see pockets that things aren't doing well, they come back and they benchmark to ask why. So it's not supposed to be punitive. It's supposed to be benchmarking. Why are people getting be better results than you are? And feed it back comparative data. So this feedback and benchmarking is informed in part by electronic medical records. We're finally rolling ours out, but there's several countries that have been at 100% of doctors for a while. They're more rudimentary than ours, but they've used them for years as part of their understanding of who their population are. So when we were asking US doctors, would you be able to make a list of your sickest patients, your diabetic patients, do you know how many of them have? Would that be easy or difficult? They said really hard. You know, we kind of have a rough idea. Other countries have said very easy. You know, we have a way of knowing who our sickest population is or our most needy population and focusing on it. Um, feedback to practices, how do you compare to other practices? How are your patients doing, including use of the hospital ED, drug, adverse um, interactions? So they're thinking of these information systems as being a tool that's useful for doctors, decision support, as well as the country. Um, this is a picture of a Danish doctor's office and a U.S. doctor that uh, one of my colleagues took because he said, you know, in Denmark, I never saw an office that looked quite like that in terms of paper. And he said that was what his paper, his office looked like. Because Denmark was very early on um, to develop, they, they wanted to go paperless. And as I click through these, I think, um, well, you can see them in the slide. And these are all, you can get these slides because I'm going through them quickly. They kept adding on what they could do both at the practice level and then through a central thing called MedCom. MedCom was developed for them by IBM here in the United States. And this was decades ago. It's, it's pretty simple. But what they've ended up doing is they can pay their physicians for an e-consult. You can refer to a specialist via this central system and book an appointment. They can do drug-drug reconciliation, see what you're on. And now they're saying they can use it as a um, research base. Which, which populations are doing relatively better or worse with certain procedures? And what several countries are saying, we should do this globally. The US would enter it with 300 million people. We would know whether treating people with this protocol versus that protocol was relatively better, that we could build up the evidence base rather than just the art of medicine. It could be more of a science. So Denmark and several countries are saying this is more than just a tool for doctors. It's a tool for the country. Germany, um, the, the German language is in German here. So uh, the, the speaker who presented this in Australia did a nice job for us to do some of this in English. But they've been collecting hospital quality. And again, this is on all p German patients. It's not on a, just the Medicare patients or just some other. But they do it on key indicators, outcome details such as infection rates, mortality rates, complication rates. It's put up on a public database so you can see whether your hospital is better or worse or about equal. But it's fed back on a clinical level to individual physicians. They can get lower down on this. And the physicians have started using it, and the hospitals have started losing it, uh, because they're paid on a diagnostic basis. So if you're paid on average, 
um, an average rate and you've got a sicker patient with complications and coming back because they bundle up the readmission rates, you're going to lose money. They can use this now to say, why do I have so many outliers on costs? And, they, and discover its infection rates. He said, um, of the 200 outliers on costs, 50% of them had infection rates. And the hospitals could track it to what department was getting those infection rates and zero in on it. So they're thinking of it as a quality improvement tool. They don't pay on the basis of this but it's a feedback system and they're looking for constant improvement. The other thing they do that's quite interesting is they send peers to go visit you. Who are, the peers are the places like you that are doing better and to try to talk through what's going on. So use the fact that they're um, all in it together. I'm going backwards. So that's, but the information systems and the fact that the whole population in, I think is just critical for letting you know why they can be targeting. Um, and so now what's going on um, and what's really exciting, and I think this is an exciting era for the U.S., by the way, and I will end on the exciting thing. A lot is going on in this country where business as usual is no longer good enough. But they're saying, can't we in the 21st century, we've got digital technology, we've got smartphones where nurses and doctors could communicate by Skype. We can take a picture of all the medicines in the medicine cabinet if someone went home. We could do drug reconciliation. We can reach remote villages. We can do different things, so we should change the way we're working. Because we were, all of our jobs and the way we were trained were for a time you couldn't work as a team and you couldn't be virtual teams. So there, there's a lot of effort to say, putting those pieces together, there are new roles for nurses, there are new roles for doctors. Can you train differently? Can you bring aids on? And using telecommunication, again, with a focus on population health. And I'm just gonna give you a few um, examples of people thinking out of the box and the way they organize care systems. One's from India. And he gets written up a lot because he's gotten the price of complicated heart surgery way down. And this is a doctor that went to medical school in the US. But he went and re-engineered heart care and said, where's the wasted time? Where are infection rates? He's bar none. And he wanted to bring it down cheap enough so anyone in India could have it. And so the high income people pay for it and they cross-subsidize. They also have cataract surgery with zero infection rates, great outcomes, rethinking lenses. And they start, when in some of these countries, they can start, there was nobody licensed for some of this, so they can just say, how should we design roles and think differently? But you've got places like France thinking through what's infant care, what's maternity care at a community level. Does it have to be just the doctor's office? They have creches. You've got Sweden saying, what if we co-locate primary care, pediatric care, and public health all in a, a similar location? Does it facilitate more teamwork? Uh, there is cross-national learning even for the United States, um, and increasingly so, the elastic Alaskan dental technologists and aides were because someone was at a conference where New Zealand said we've trained dental techs to both do preventive care, dental hygienists, and drill and fill, simple cavities. Because if they are, have good hands, and they could have been a carpenter, <laughs> there's no reason they can't do simple dentistry. And nowhere in Alaska do they have any dentist willing to go to a village with 200 people in it that was only reachable by dog sled or plane. So they had no dental care. So there wasn't opposition from the dental profession to this. And they were trained in Washington State, who opened up a training program. And now it's being used in Minnesota as well. Um, so some of this is breaking through licensure restrictions. But these technicians, uh, uh, federal government and several have sent up, are getting as good, if not better, outcomes than the typical dentist. So it's a pretty exciting, and it's a new career path. Plus, they're using digital technology because there's telecommunication with the central dentist, um, talking with the patient, talking with the nurse, so they're not out there alone. So it, it's, it's really pretty exciting time. Um, so I'm just jumping down into the US a little bit now with a few examples of this thinking about the three big keys here are providing access coupled with payment reforms that really drive a new set of incentives, focused on thinking about a team and a care system rather than isolated, and, and, and using information systems differently. 
within the U.S., this is what our spending looks like. And uh, Charlie mentioned that I worked with SEIU for years um, on policy and research. And what was amazing is this always looks the same, that the top 5% of people <laughs> accounted for a huge volume of spending every year, whether it was the employee group, whether it's the Medicare group or the Medicaid group, and the healthiest. This is a, a thing that it's really worth focusing on. 50% of the population could not go at all during the year, and only 3% of the costs would disappear. So there's increased focus on who are those sicker people. They're not the same every year. You know, it had a heart attack one year, was fine the following year, some are ill every year. And what's going on with that population? And increasingly, there's a population approach, and this is happening globally in the United States, and said, how do I stop the 50% of the healthiest from moving up to become the sicker? And how do I care for the sicker population less expensively by doing a better job? This is Cincinnati Children's, um, and they were focused on asthma. They were pretty sure they de delivered exactly the same care for their asthmatic kids to all the kids that came to Cincinnati Children. Um, and 50% of their population's Medicaid, they had uninsured. And then they plotted it by zip code and said either genetically, certain children all decided to live in certain neighborhoods that were, had a propensity for asthma, or something is going on in these neighborhoods. Um, a huge variation. And there's no amount of inhalers we can give to this population that's going to do this. So let's go out and take a look. And they went out and did home inspections. They did, uh, is there cigarette smoking? And they involved the housing authorities. Now, the other thing they did that was very cool um, is they redid their electronic medical records and put in how we all go in and say, is there any history of heart disease or cancer in the family? They went in to put housing, depression, other social and economic in the medical record. So when the, the high-risk kids come in, they get a special team. Um, and they know to link. Now, the one I'm not showing you that um, Rob Kahn, who presented this to us, showed us, then the same families that were the high use are also in areas with high infant mortality rate, high teenage pregnancy rate. There's a whole system. When they did United Way and all the social services, they were all seeing those same families on different days. And no one was coordinating. WIC was telling the family a different thing than the pediatrician. So they started doing a community approach, but it's driven by the status system, which is extraordinary. They took beds out of circulation. They emptied their asthma beds in the hospital. Um, and the hospital was planning on building a wing and didn't need to. So they, there was a feedback loop that was very real, and they've moved on. Mass General here. Um, was part of a, a chronic care demo where they took their sickest elderly patients, the highest cost, that high cost thing, and they did a demo with about 4,000 of them where they said, we don't actually know what we're doing well or not well with them. They just, they're in the emergency department all the time. They're in the hospital all the time. They're on 13 or 14 drugs. Um, let's develop a care system that can start looking at them. And they came up with this schema. They're redesigning their whole internal, who are the long-term care, episodic care. They put a special nurse, newly trained nurse, on a team. And they brought the um, hospital rate use rate down by 20% the emergency department by 25. They brought mortality rates down, and they reduced costs by 7% a year. Now, it took a lot of time for them to figure out how to do it. So it took a couple years before this was working. And what was interesting when Tim Ferriss talks about this is they took the sickest 4,000. And then doctors came in and said, I have the 4,001 patient. I want that man, I said, no, we're sorry. We're just staffed up for 4,000. So there, there started to be demand because the patients loved it. The doctors loved it. And it was a new care system, but very much thinking through population health. Now, within the US, we're seeing, as we start to pay differently, that the people who are primary care and think public health are starting to sit at the central table because it's starting to matter whether the patient comes back. It could be a money loser for you now rather than a winner for you. So there's a change dynamic if you start thinking about a population health schema. So which brings me to some US examples. I think we're in the most exciting time 
I've ever seen in the U.S. I started this years ago. Um, I predated the union movement by working for the Carter administration. So I was there just after we turned down Nixon's plan. You know, so I've been at this a long time. But we've got finally got insurance expansion, and we're hoping we hold it. But the Affordable Care Act has a series of tools in it that are, are getting everybody's attention no matter where you go. I had Houston doctors saying, you know that readmission map you've shown, it's like the hurricane warning and it's centered on Houston and we think we can do something about it. And we're starting to think about how do we retool our systems. And all of this is going on at once. Uh, we have so many models of redesigning primary care that I can no longer easily put symbols up. And they're all over the map because they start from wherever they are. A rural practice designs it differently than with a central city. Denver Health, which is the public health system, public hospital, designs their clinics differently. They put them near bus routes and near schools. Um, uh, group Health out on the West Coast is saying we need a different kind of team for diabetes than for depression, but then they discovered that the diabetics had depression. So they needed to stop thinking about one disease at a time and say, you know, let's think of the whole patient. So we're in, we're in a time of learning that people are looking at each other saying, what kind of results did you get? What did you do? And it can't be the primary care practices alone. Now this acronym, Accountable Care Organizations, didn't exist to the Affordable Care Act, um, and everyone said, what are these things? And we said, well, we, we're hoping that there'll be networks of doctors and physicians who say we want to be more accountable for the people we take care of. The exciting thing is it's not happening just in Massachusetts. You know, for a while, when I did geographic comparisons with the U.S., there were only a few states that you could put on a map of trying anything. So it started, it's, Massachusetts has more of them and they're further along, but it's everywhere in the United States and the private sector is starting to get involved so that you can have two or three payers doing hopefully the same thing but we haven't cracked that yet. They do almost the same thing, which makes a big difference. But you, you, you're starting to see which states have them at all and how many lives. And the um, not, not doing anything is the lightest color here, doing a lot. So you're starting to see, um, for me, seeing anything happening in the south of the country is great because for a while it seemed like no innovation would ever move south. Um, Part, partly because they don't believe in regulation, they don't believe in change incentives, they think everything is okay. Some of it is political, but it's starting to move. Um, readmission rates. Um, I, didn't, I didn't put up my chart because I have too many charts anyway, but we've got some areas of the country that have a 10% readmission rate and some areas of the country that have a 22% readmission rate for the Medicare patients. So this is just the average. It hadn't moved for decades. We announced um, when the CARE Act passed, it was announced that in a couple years, you're going to have penalties. And we are going to tell you what your readmission rates are, because hospitals don't know what their rates are. You know, it, because you might have come back to a different hospital. So in the Philadelphia hospitals, they said they didn't come back. And they said, well, they didn't come back to you. They came back to the neighborhood hospital. But they came back with a complication. And this has been a very interesting exercise, because when hospitals start to say, if I want to bring it down and avoid a penalty, I have to worry what happens when people leave the hospital. It's not necessarily that they're coming back because I did something that I can control. But they maybe went to the wrong nursing home who didn't know how to take care of them. Or I went, sent them home with incomplete instructions on drugs, so they came back with a drug-drug interaction. Tim said when, Tim Ferris at Mass General, said when they started their demo, they were looking at their drug reconciliation at the General, and they have an electronic medical record, and they discovered that 100% of the drug regimens were wrong. And people went with a piece of paper, but no one had really said, what are they taking? They just had not developed a system that captured it. So you're starting to have hospitals go visit nursing homes and find out what capacity that they have so that they don't come back again. Uh, send more information back with doctors or keep the patient one more day till they're more stable. So that it's very exciting to see these rates come down. And this is Medicare, but it's coming down for other patients too. So we're, because Medicare is such a powerful payer across the country, we're affecting the system. 
So when I look forward, um, I, on the, the bottom two bullets are the optimistic part, that we've got a whole bunch of new tools and resources. Um, everyone is focused on cost. Uh, people, instead of saying we've got the best system in the world, we just have to pay for it, people are saying we're paying enough, we should expect more. And that you're hearing everywhere. No one wants to see it keep going up. But we've got two Americas, and, we don't, and we're relying on local leadership and politics. So we need for the country to move. We need to see all parts of the country. So this is out of a report we did on vulnerable populations, and I'm just showing you a few charts. These are me Medicare beneficiaries getting drugs they're not supposed to get because they're 65 and older. And uh, a, a higher dot is a bad thing to be. There are high-income people in some states that are getting many more of these drugs than the low-income people in other states. There's, there's disparities by income, but the practice of medicine looks different in different parts of the country, and this is just on drug prescribing. Uh, those, that prevent, potentially preventable death rate that I showed the U.S. compared to the U.K. and other countries, this is within the United States, how much variation we have where some states look quite good, um, start to get near, not quite as good as France. Um, this is the same statistic applied in the U.S., not quite as good as France. And when we first put these out, people said, oh, it's black. It's African-American, they die younger, which is absolutely true. We said, well, actually, the white rate varies a lot, too. It's not just a race story, although race is part of the story. There's huge variation. This is one we did more recently that said people reached the age of 25, so they got past the point where they've been dying from gunshot wounds. Um, they had a high school education or college or higher, and the disparities by education, because these death rates are enormous. And again, the differences across the country are huge. If you superimpose some of this on the states, which states have decided to expand insurance and which states have not on their Medicaid population, you'll find a disconnect. Um, that the states that are doing worse in their outcomes or some of the states are holding back on the big Medicaid expansions. Uh, a few aren't. Uh, Kentucky is in there with the best of them saying we want a healthier Kentucky and it's called healthier Kentucky. So we're, we're hoping over time we're going to see the whole curve come down and look more similar across the country. Meanwhile, we're in a breather period, and everyone's really excited by costs slowing down. They're slowing down in the private sector. They're slowing down faster in Medicare. Um, anyone who's on Medicare may not have noticed it, but their premium did not go up for two years, and the deductible did not go up for two years because Medicare has been flat. No increase per person. We haven't seen that in years. Um, and it's projected to keep going slower than history. Private is going up faster everywhere. Um, and most of what's underneath the pri private is price increases. Uh, Massachusetts had a report recently that said the premium increase, even though it's slower, is a combination of people using less and prices going up. So we're, we're cutting back. So the question is whether we're going to sustain this or not. Uh, Charlie said $18,000 for a family premium. That's about right. In some parts of the country, it's $20,000. Um, it's outstripping people's income. So if they had to buy it on their own and they were middle income, they wouldn't be able to afford it. And this is a shared concern. No matter where you go, people say it's just really expensive. And this is in an era where their deductibles have doubled. Cost sharing is up. So the premium's buying less than it used to, but it's still going up. When we look at the whole country, um, you hear debate that focuses on Medicare or Medicaid, but private spending is half of what we're spending in the United States. So we, unless we do a whole country approach, we're not going to be uh, holding the line at that 17.6% where we've been pretty lucky for a couple of years. We're on our way to one out of every $5 in the U.S. Um, goes into the healthcare system. So I'm wrapping up, um, opening up. So just remembering that I think the key policies where the other countries provide insight for us are these payment policies, trying to think of a system that's based on primary care, but a system and redesigning that information and thinking about whole population. And just to leave you with this terrific chart Betsy Bradley at Yale did, she said, you know, we spend the most by far 
on health care. But if I add in social service spending, job retraining, disability payment, other countries are spending more. So they, they think of policies that keep people healthy, and they're doing it out of different budgets, including long-term care and home support. Uh, so we're, not, we're on the high side on the medical, but on the low side on everything else. So that is, in conclusion, uh, the big challenge is pulling together, because we are a fragmented system. We don't have these unified payment systems. You can see in Massachusetts people saying, let's get all payer kinds of approaches, even though they're different payers, let's get on the same page. Uh, one of my colleagues said, you have people pulling together, but a couple of these cute little people are uh, facing in the wrong direction. And I said, <laughs> yes, but they're being pulled in the, <laughs> in the same direction. So they may be pulling some unwilling people around, but we need that kind of leadership if we want to get better outcomes, better care experiences, and slower growth. Thanks.